Adelante, muchas, gra muchas gracias, muchas gracias. Gracias. Thank you very much, uh, Hernán, uh, for this very nice presentation. It's my pleasure today to be here with you, uh, sharing uh, our experience in the last years on this very issue of obesity and metabolic syndrome in children. You know, Chile is uh, close to my heart, as uh, Hernán said. Thank you, Alejandro, also Professor Martinez, for the nice invitation. Chile is a wonderful country. And uh, I have to say that uh, one day I want to come back to see uh, all my friends there in, uh, in Santiago and in other places in Chile. Chile is a beautiful, very beautiful country. So thank you very much indeed for giving me this opportunity to speak about this issue of obesity and metabolic syndrome in children. This is my disclosure. Uh, as Hernan said, I'm actually um, working for the European Commission and the WHO and an Italian GO, which is uh, particularly involved in, uh, in uh, non-communicable diseases in children. And I will uh, end my, uh, uh, my office in 2022 next year. It's, it's been a fantastic experience, particularly in this very period of, uh, of the COVID-19, which has uh, even uh, troubles in the developing, developed countries, but particularly in uh, developing countries. Well, just to remind you that there is no vaccine for uh, Africa and other uh, places in the world. So we have to think about that. Uh, obesity uh, in children uh, is increasing. This is not a very, a very good news for everybody. Uh, if we look at the data that are now 11 years old, uh, uh, developed by the uh, CDC, the Center for Disease Control in Atlanta in the US, you can appreciate that in the, in the 76 to 80, the prevalence of obesity in, uh, in uh, um, children, in preschool children aged two to, to five, where it was about 5%. And if you look at uh, just uh, uh, 25 to, 50 to 30 years after that, it was doubled in preschool children. If we consider school children, primary school children, the prevalence uh, uh, was from 6.5 to uh, three times uh, to 18.1. And finally, in adolescence, from 5%, which was similar to the uh, preschool children, jumped to almost 20%. So it, it is really a pandemic, the real pandemic. The more, if, and if, if we consider obesity a, a disease, which in fact should be considered, uh, this is the most frequent disease in childhood, in pediatrics. So this is a very uh, issue that we have to discuss. Obviously, this is a pandemic, another pandemic, uh, previous to the COVID-19, and we have data already on that. Uh, this is a, a paper published on Lancet six years ago. You can appreciate here that uh, uh, in the USA, all, all in all, uh, there was a three time prevalence of obesity in children. We, we mentioned USA because we have data on that, which could, should be reliable data. But if you uh, consider all over the world, Look at China, for instance, which is uh, giving us some uh, good data uh, epidemiologically, most, more, more recently, is almost tripled. And also in South America, we, there is data in Brazil here in green. Uh, if we consider from 1975 to uh, almost 2010, more or less, was again. Uh, five times prevalence of obesity in children. Uh, as uh, Hernan mentioned, the uh, is close to the Adriatic Sea on the other side, it's a nice city uh, on the very close to the shore. You see the mountains here and vice versa. You can go to skiing and see that the sea is nice 
you want to visit it, it's nice. I'm not coming from originally from this area. I started in Siena, which is in Tuscany here. And you can appreciate from this uh, slide that uh, actually there is a gradient north to south in my country. Uh, in other words, uh, a, a child living in Aosta Valley, which is this small, um, small region up to the north, a very nice skiing resort here, comparing to Sicily, uh, which is not far from Africa, actually. Uh, Italy is a quite a long country, it's around 1,300 kilometers. And you can appreciate that the risk of developing obesity in a child coming from Sicily or from Calabria, which is another uh, nice region in the south, or, or in Puglia, where my parents, where I was born. Actually, uh, you can appreciate that the risk of developing uh, obesity in my country, and these are data collected in 2019, uh, is uh, very much different, coming from 10 to 12 percent in, in uh, Aosta Valley or in the north here close to Austria. Uh, compared to uh, 35, even 40 percent in some areas of the very south of the country, which means, you know, even if we consider, we will come back to this, to the to the uh, gene um, environment relations in the development of obesity uh, in children. A more recent uh, paper, a very interesting paper, I have to say. Um, comparing the um, obesity prevalence into, you can see here, from 5 to 19 years of age, you can see here in 1975, and then jumping it to 2016, you can, if you read here, red is more obesity, uh, yellow is less, uh, and you can appreciate, again, I go back, for a minute, that even in the United States or in Argentina, not far from Chile, and Australia, you see jumping to the very high prevalence of around 30 percent. Sorry, there is somebody with the microphone off. Oh, no, sorry. Uh, you can appreciate how can uh, some places in the world went up dramatically with uh, with uh, obesity, and this is particularly true here in, uh, in uh, Oceania, in the Pacific area. I will come back again to this. And you, we, you can appreciate if compare the 1975 to uh, 2016, you can see here that the prevalence of obesity is really increased dramatically. We have to think about that because uh, obviously in uh, 40 years, there are no variation of genes. So something in the environment uh, was uh, wrong. And we know what is this, is the availability of food, which is too much compared to the, what is, are the needs for, children, for everybody, and particularly for children. You can better appreciate this jumping uh, in some areas. If you look at, uh, for instance, Botswana, which is uh, in the southern part of Africa, or even in Vietnam or in, in Laos here in Southeast Asia, you can again appreciate how even in developing countries, actually Botswana is one of the richest countries in Africa and in the world because of the diamonds. And you can see here that availability of food everywhere in the world has, has brought to the, uh, to the increase of obesity around the world. Obviously, therefore, the International Obesity Task Force um, obviously stated that the current obesity pandemic reflects the profound changes to the society over the, the past 20 to 30 years, which obviously promotes sedentary, obesogenic lifestyle and the consumption of high fat, energy and fructose. We will come back to the role of fructose in, in children. Obviously, it's not our very issue to take care of these very patients, because obviously we want to prevent that. What we should, as pediatricians, try to understand is to uh, understand why the shape of our children, particularly in developing, developed countries, is dramatically changing. 
So therefore, we are pediatricians. It's, it's not... Normal child, true, it's just normal. This is important because if we have one out of three children, uh, children will appear to everybody, to the parents, the family as a lean child. So we have to, to, uh, to, ref to think about that. Uh, as many of you may know, uh, I've been a very good traveler in my life. I've been all, everywhere, everywhere in the world. And I, I challenge you to recognize where, where Nauru is. Do you know where Nauru is? It's one of the 196 uh, countries in the world. And it is a very interesting, very interesting areas for, uh, for the WHO. Why? Because Nauru is a small island, a volcanic island in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. It is a very interesting uh, uh, natural experiment how uh, the environment may influence the obesity prevalence. This is Nauru people in 1914. Nauru at that time, the pe these people lived uh, with fishing, actually fishing, and then uh, Nauru afterwards was uh, the richest country in the world for a while. Why? Because they had the biggest phosphate mine in the world. And therefore, when phosphate was uh, uh, very important in the uh, world economy, uh, Nauru was actually the richest country in the world, richer than Dubai or the Emirates or Qatar, etc. Why? The, the, the mean income of each Nauru person was uh, $500,000 per year, you can imagine. And therefore, they had availability of food. But obviously, you can imagine in the uh, previous centuries, uh, the genes that we were selected for, to survive to the lack of food were the genes that afterwards, with the availability of food and energy, transformed the, the nice Nauru, lean Nauru people in the fattest country in the world. You can imagine, in Nauru, 95% of people, including children, are obese. So this means that just in a century. And this is very worrying because if we think about non-communicable diseases in children, uh, and we consider again, obesity as the uh, most frequent disease in childhood, which is, this is a really a, a, a risk, let me say a Damocles sword on the head of these children, because we know already that obesity may increase insulin resistance, and type 2 diabetes gives a precocious puberty, let's say um, early puberty at least, and PCOS and possibly hypogonadism. In addition, obesity may increase the risk of cardiovascular disease, and then namely we will come back to this, this lipidemia, hypertension, chronic inflammation, endothelial dysfunction, or coagulopathy, etc. And obviously we know, again, we come back to this, that um, steatohepatitis is a risk factor for long-term uh, complication and eventually uh, liver cirrhosis. So it's, it's not trivial. Not mentioning other complications that we, we tend to forget. I'm referring particularly to pulmonary, where our group has uh, has contributed to this, to the relation between obesity and asthma, for instance, or, or sleep apnea. And particularly important is glomerulosclerosis, the renal involvement of uh, obesity, uh, and the risk for long-term complications in the kidney. So can we then try as pediatricians to uh, detect 
metabolic syndrome in children early in the course of uh, this disease. Let me come, go back to uh, Dr. Reagan, which I, who I have uh, met several times when I was in the United States, who in the adults uh, spoke about uh, the uh, syndrome X. He didn't know how to call this syndrome this uh, constellation of uh, symptoms like uh, particularly glucose intolerance. Please refer to this glucose intolerance because for uh, our uh, colleagues, uh, our diabet colleagues diabetologists, uh, glucose intolerance is a key factor in a key um, part of the uh, syndrome X of the metabolic syndrome. But associated to glucose intolerance, there is hypertension, low HDL, increased of uh, lipidemia, cholesterol in general, particularly triglycerides, and insulin, increase of insulin. And this uh, syndrome X has uh, insulin resistance as the underlying mechanism. So many studies have been done in adults on this syndrome X, at the, end, at the end of the day, it was called metabolic syndrome, which is not only metabolic, of course, is therefore in children, for instance, if we look at children, obviously we, have, we can, may have hypertension associated, we may have dyslipidemia as well, fatty liver, as we remind, PCOS, systemic inflammation, endothelial dysfunction, an increase in cardiovascular risk and possibly at the end of the day, having glucose intolerance. So the first key message that I want to tell you and that we will come back to this is that uh, we should not wait for glucose intolerance to make a diagnosis of metabolic syndrome in pediatrics. And this is a, something that we have to, 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 take, to take into account because in the last years, we have been referring to a definition of the IDF of metabolic syndrome, which is, uh, doesn't fit with the, uh, the needs for children. If you want to look at the, um, the number of metabolic risk factors, this is a very, quite an old study from the group in Chicago, uh, they, were, they made one of the few studies in which they measured insulin sensitivity with uh, an hyperinsulinemic clamp, which is the gold standard for measuring the insulin sensitivity in children. And you can uh, easily appreciate that the, uh, the, the risk factors associated with metabolic syndrome were, were related to the, uh, the level of insulin sensitivity. In other words, the higher is your insulin sensitivity, the lower is the risk of having metabolic risk factors. Therefore, this was one of the few studies showing robustly that the insulin sensitivity is the key factor for uh, uh, metabolic syndrome. So measuring insulin resistance is important for understanding if that very child has a risk for developing metabolic syndrome and then possibly type 2 diabetes at the end of the day. So coming back, what is metabolic syndrome? So it is, if a parent asks you, asks you uh, what is metabolic syndrome in children? So we refer, and we have referred for a long time, to the IDF definition, which was the definition of uh, Paul Zimmet published on the Lancet in 2007. The bad news for us as pediatricians is that uh, some, of, of some pediatricians were part of this panel who published this uh, very, uh, very paper on Lancet uh, now 14 years ago. So they said, listen to me, they said that uh, age six to less than 10 years. So forget about children, preschool children, right? So we, they started from age six. So we want to discuss with you on that. Definition of metabolic syndrome. 
obesity, more than 97 and 90 percentile, as I said, by waist circumference, which is fine. But then they stated that metabolic syndrome cannot, cannot be diagnosed, but further measurements should be made if family history of metabolic syndrome, type 2 diabetes, dyslipidemia, cardiovascular disease, hypertension, or obesity. So in some way, we as pediatricians should not be worried about metabolic syndrome in prepubertal children, excuse me, in preschool children, forget about preschool children. Uh, we should start to, to worry about uh, 10 years of age or more when the metabolic syndrome may be uh, defined as uh, uh, obesity more than 90 percentile as assessed by waist circumference, triglycerides more than 1.7 millimole per liter, which is uh, in Italy is more than 151 milligram per deciliter, HD cholest HDL cholesterol less than 1.03, which is more uh, less than 40 milligram per deciliter, a systolic blood pressure more than 130 milligram. MMG or diastolic blood pressure more than 85 mmHg. And you see here glucose more than 101 milligram per deciliter, 5.6 millimole per liter. Um, obviously, they recommended to perform the neural glucose uh, tolerance test, and we will come back to this. And then finally, after 16 years in the late adolescence, we should use the same criteria for IDF uh, for adult. So this was the definition that we have, we have referred to for 14 years now, ladies and gentlemen. So I want to, to challenge this definition and try to share with you what we shared in this very paper that we published some years ago, saying that uh, we, there is this is time for us to, to try to uh, diagnose uh, metabolic syndrome early in the course of, of children's life. Actually, there is no standard definition of the metabolic syndrome for children and adolescents. We, let's say, there are limits. We are nice people, but we should reject the application of adult definition in children to, to the, the adult definition is not appropriate for children. And several studies have shown an alarming increase in many components of the metabolic syndrome in children using a variety of definitions. So therefore, we should be clever enough to have a clear definition of metabolic syndrome in children. So therefore, we need age and sex specific cut points which should be used for children and adolescents to account for normal growth and development. So, but the problem is which particular cut point should be used? Should we, we should use national versus internal cohort cut points, or we should use some diagnostic criteria which should be different from, uh, from the adult definition. We can, cannot use the adult definition. Now let's, let, me, uh, uh, let me ask you uh, if you agree on these uh, uh, question points that I want to share with you. Is it true and acceptable for us as pediatricians that metabolic syndrome cannot be diagnosed in toddlers and prepubertal pre children? Are there other important parameters to be included in the definition of metabolic syndrome, which has, has been, have been neglected in the literature so far. And is waist circumference a parameter easily and reliably applicable in children and adolescents? These are three questions that I will try to, to answer in uh, the next few minutes. So first question, is it true that metabolic syndrome cannot be diagnosed in toddlers and prepubertal children, as the IDF definition states. If you look at the National Cholesterol Panel, 
they defined the uh, metabolic syndrome in adults many years ago now as abdominal obesity, increased triglycerides, HDL cholesterol less than 50 milligram per deciliter in females and less than 40 milligram per deciliter in males, blood pressure 130 to 85, which is the definition that is in the IDF definition, and uh, a fasting pl plasma glucose more than 110. This is in adults. So if we apply, and we try to do that in that paper that is cited here, uh, to make the same in children, we should uh, say, okay, uh, obesity more, BMI, I don't know if BMI is appropriate, triglyceride, then if we want to use the triglycerides, we should refer to a 95th percentile of our age, sex, and ethnic group. This is not trivial. And I will come back to this. HDL cholesterol less than 5th percentile, blood pressure more than 95th percentile, and impaired glucose tolerance. If we perform a, a, an OGTT, we should refer to the definition of the American Diabetes Association. So again, three or more or obesity, and then we can discuss how to define obesity. We can uh, challenge this definition, of course. Triglycerides, that, let me tell you that if you refer to the adult 150 milligram per deciliter, which is 1.7 millimole per liter, then you can underestimate an hypertriglyceridemia in a child, say, 40 years old. Because obviously, if a child 40 years old is 120 or one millimole per liter, then you say, okay, triglyceride are normal. But actually, that value in a child 40 years old is an is hypertriglyceridemia. Same for HDL cholesterol. Blood pressure, we know the American, uh, the American Academy of Pediatrics have published many papers, many statements on how to measure blood pressure in children and how to estimate blood pressure in children. I'm referring not only to the centiles, but also, for instance, to the early detection of hypertension in children, which actually could be, for instance, a non dipic child during the 24 hours ambulatory blood pressure control, which is normally the gold standard to evaluate in an hypertension in children. And if we look at the impaired glucose tolerance, then do we really need to make an OGTT to every child to assess the risk? And then we can accept fasting plasma glucose more than 100 milligram per deciliter or more than 5.6 millimole per liter. Why I should say is not indispensable to make an OGTT? Because actually, as we said, glucose intolerance in obese children, in those with a risk for metabolic syndrome are actually quite a late component of metabolic syndrome. In other words, we should try to detect the children at risk for developing metabolic syndrome independently by glucose intolerance. That's the very message that I want to, to tell you tonight. And in fact, Ebed Adamo, many years ago now, in, a, in our series, in our prepubertal children, strictly prepubertal, applying the definition that we have just uh, evaluated and considered, making an OGTT this time, she was able uh, on, uh, to, to detect metabolic syndrome in 30% uh, of our small series of, of children with, uh, with uh, uh, obesity. So metabolic syndrome is much more frequent than we think about. Let's say, let's underline that 30% of children had hypertriglyceridemia if we apply not the 150 milligram per deciliter, but in the 95th percentile. And also, worryingly, uh, one third of these prepubertal, again, prepubertal obese children was hypertensive. So we should try not to underestimate uh, hypertension and uh, hypertriglyceridemia 
these children. More recently, uh, the uh, IDEFIX, which is a consortium uh, working in, uh, in, uh, in Europe uh, on obesity in children and prevention of obesity in children, uh, in other, were able to show that the, the criteria that we proposed before are acceptable for us as pediatricians. Again, instead of obesity, we can discuss about that in a minute if waist circumference may be reliable uh, rather than obesity, and this is based on the fact that visceral obesity is more dangerous than uh, subcutaneous obesity. We can discuss about that. Systolic blood pressure, or diastolic blood pressure, more than 90 percentile. Triglycerides, more than 90 percentiles, or HDL cholesterol, less than 10 percentile. And the OMIR, which is, as you know, a, a marker of, uh, of uh, uh, I, uh, insulin resistance or fast blood, uh, plasma glucose, more than 90th or 95th percentile. Why uh, IDEFIX, uh, which is a very much appreciated in Europe, uh, made the 90th and 95th percentile? What's, what's the difference? If a child has more than, for instance, let's, let's, let's focus on systolic blood pressure or diastolic blood pressure. If a child has a, a, a blood pressure more than 90th percentile, that you, pediatricians should monitor them and follow them longitudinally. If there is, the, the child has a, a blood pressure, even a four years old, old child, a blood pressure more than 95th percentile, then there is an action there which means that I, the child has to lose weight or possibly to use the antihypertensive drugs. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, please uh, notice what happens if we, you in Chile use the IDF definition, which was the, the one that I showed before, or if you move to the IDEFIX definition, which is the definition based on what we proposed on the paper of Lancet, okay? And you can see that, uh, let's more focus on uh, blood pressure. If you use the, the blood pressure cutoff of IDF, which I remind you is 130 on, for systolic and 80 for diastolic, then you, you have a very low percentage of children with hypertension, okay? But if you use the IDEFIX, which is based on the centiles, and this is the very pediatric aspect of metabolic syndrome, then the blood pressure you can see here, the, in, the hypertension is around 15% at the monitoring level, more than 90th percentile. And worryingly, 10% of children uh, have hypertension with the actual level, which means that uh, uh, the blood pressure is more than 95th percentile, which is a warning, isn't it? So again, if you use the, uh, the uh, cutoff point for uh, glucose, then you underestimate again, both in girls and in boys, the uh, risk for developing type 2 diabetes uh, at the level of uh, uh, monitoring, which is uh, more than 90 percentile, either for the OMIR or the fasting blood glucose. And again, worryingly, one out of 10 children with uh, obesity have. Uh, impair glucose tolerance. So this is a serious one. And if we read this paper, they propose the metabolic syndrome score, which is based on waist circumference, systolic blood pressure, diastolic blood pressure, triglycerides, H HDL cholesterol, and HOMA IR. We can discuss if HOMA IR is appropriate or not for for detecting insulin resistance, but at the end of the day, 
you can calculate a metabolic syndrome score even in prepubertal children. Please appreciate that this scale, this centile, is uh, beginning in a three years old child. So you have, as pediatricians, we have the mean to understand which child has a risk for developing metabolic syndrome. In other words, if you have a female six years old and you have these risk factors calculated with this score, you can calculate a, a six years old child uh, with eight uh, metabolic syndrome score and you can calculate this, uh, this centile of the score and you can say this child has a risk, for instance, here, eight, and uh, this, this uh, girl, this uh, young girl, and this, and this boy, for instance, has again a, a metabolic syndrome score. And so you can detect children during prepuberty and even in preschool children, in very young children. This is what we, we, we need as pediatricians. We can't wait until the child is 10 years old or even worse when he or she is an adolescent. So this is, I think, an important message that I want to share with you. The second question is, are there other important parameters to be included in the definition of metabolic syndrome? The answer is yes. And these, these parameters are widely neglected in the definition of the IDF and even in the definition that you can find in the textbooks. Why? Because we know already from many years that the liver has a very important role in, in insulin sensitivity and insulin resistance. To cut a long story short, if you become an insulin resistant person, the first thing first, and you have particularly visceral adipose tissue, then the, there is an increase of production of triglycerides in the liver. And therefore there is an accumulation of fat inside the liver. And this is quite dangerous because obviously is an insult. There is a, what we call the lipotoxicity. This is an insult to the liver. And this can induce a state, steato, uh, steatosis first. And then because of the inflammation, which is mediated by several uh, cytokines, uh, then you can develop steatohepatitis and finally fibrosis. This is well, very well known. And some years ago, again, Ebed Adamo, before she went to, to Sonia Caprio in Yale, she was able to, in a, in, a, in a group of children here in Kieti, to show that those showing in the other way around, starting for, from steatosis, that if you select children with steatosis, then you can find these children with the higher glucose insulin ratio, it's a lower glucose insulin ratio, and higher OMIR. The Matsuda index is much lower. Matsuda index is an index which is related to, to the insulin resistance and the uh, area under the curve, if you, if you develop it, an OGTT is much higher, and the, even the glycemia is, is higher, higher, significantly higher. In other words, we should include the steatosis when we evaluate a child with obesity, because the, 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 having a steatosis is a risk factor for developing glucose intolerance and type 2 diabetes later in life. So the other way around, we should not neglect steatosis in a child with obesity. And I think also if we want to, to speak about anecdotal things, not very scientific, scientific things, you can imagine if you say 
if you tell a mother or a father or a grandmother in Italy, for instance, grandmothers are very important and sometimes very dangerous. And they think, okay, the child is obese, doesn't work. Don't worry, no problems. If we say, listen, this child has obesity, but he or she has also uh, fat, liver, and there's also hypertension, maybe the message that uh, obesity is actually a, a, a disease is more efficient, more impacting on the, on the uh, social psychology and the family psychology. This is a problem in Italy, I don't know in Chile, but uh, I think it's worldwide that we have to make people aware that the uh, obesity and diabetes are really very important risk factors for future generations. There are not, no peanuts. It's an important message that I think we have to uh, deliver to our uh, people everywhere, even uh, through the media, in order to make the, 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 the patients, uh, the, the citizens, the people aware of this. And again, if you look at, at your uh, children with obesity and you look very carefully, for uh, in pre, even in prepubertal, you see these are the children which were uh, in this very paper some years ago, strictly prepubertal, even in prepubertal children, if you measure carefully, for instance, for instance if you pay, measure uh, blood pressure very carefully uh, with the uh, 24 hours uh, ambulatory blood pressure control, you can find 35% of children with, with hypertension and 25, 26 people, children with the hypertrigliceridemia. You can find 5% of your children with the impaired glucose tolerance. And uh, one out of five have a, a non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. So it's, it's, it's relevant, isn't it? So I think if we are very careful in, uh, in uh, evaluating children with obesity, we can find already early signs of metabolic syndrome in these children. And recently, Serena Scapatici, who is a young doctor here, uh, made this very nice, uh, um, very nice review on the role of uh, uh, healthy uh, of liver in the, in the uh, end stage uh, liver disease and, and uh, first fatty liver and then NASH and finally end stage liver disease and type two diabetes with the metabolic syndrome. So hyperinsulinemia, hyperglycemia and the, some genes, we are, will come back to the, to the role of genes. Obviously there are some genes, this, this one is the very difficult to pronounce, sterol regulator element binding protein one and this one is the carbohydrate response element binding protein which are important uh, genes in regulating uh, the, uh, the accumulation of, uh, uh, of uh, triglycerides and, uh, and uh, fatty, uh, fatty liver inside the liver. And you can see there, are, there is a genetic predisposition and the epigenetic changes. So, so the challenge for the future will be to uh, evaluate those children who are genetically at risk I don't have the time to go into details, but uh, uh, our group together with, uh, with the, the group in Yale of Sonia Capio, Cosimo Giannini in particular, was able to demonstrate some years ago that uh, if you have uh, some very genes who are uh, related to the insulin secretion in that, in that very case, you can predict the risk of uh, developing type two diabetes, in, uh, glucose intolerance and type two diabetes. And this is the challenge that we want to face in the future, to understand who are the children who, who eventually can be at risk for developing cardiovascular diseases and type two diabetes, which are the most important factors when we speak about metabolic syndrome in children. Finally, is waist circumference a part, an, easily, an easy parameter and reliable parameter applicable in children and adolescents. Um, you may know that we already mentioned that, that if you accumulate visceral 
fat, the risk of developing metabolic syndrome is much higher. There are several studies on that. Uh, if you have more visceral fat in this, uh, in this very uh, study, uh, you have more risk to have developing, I, developing IG, IGT. Uh, if you have a visceral subcutaneous cutaneous ratio, which is bad, the, the risk of developing IGT is more or less three times compared with those with a more favorable distribution of the uh, visceral fat. And if we consider these two children, uh, you, can, you will come back again to, to this. This child with normal glucose tolerance and this child with impaired glucose tolerance, the risk of developing impaired glucose tolerance is much, is much higher uh, in those with more visceral fat area. This child has almost three times the visceral fat areas. But even worse is the fact that the intramyocellular fat is much more increased in those with, with uh, increased visceral fat. So the presence of visceral fat is a major risk factor for developing uh, impaired glucose tolerance and in some way to predict impaired glucose tolerance. You can see you can appreciate much better what I'm saying from these three children. These are three children. You can appreciate here, same age, 14 years, be similar BMI, 35, 34, 33, but with, uh, with similar percent fat, 41, 39, 38, okay? So three very similar children. But if we look at the proportion of visceral fat, the one on the left has uh, say half of the visceral fat compared with the, the one on the right. And if you compare fasting insulin, two hour glucose values, triglycerides and HDL cholesterol, you can easily uh, appreciate that the insulin resistance evaluated with the uh, Matsuda index with this uh, WBISI index. Fast, even fasting insulin, again, I hope you can ask me about the role of fasting insulin in, in evaluating a child with metabolic syndrome. Two hour glucose, you can appreciate here, and triglycerides are much higher. So we can uh, accept, I think, the concept that the higher is the visceral fat, the higher is the risk of developing metabolic syndrome and uh, possibly glucose intolerance. Therefore, and please challenge me on this uh, uh, statement, we wrote that uh, West circumference is an independent predictor for risk of obesity related complications, even in childhood, because it is associated with hyperinsulinemia, the insulin resistance, dyslipidemia, hypertension, and metabolic syndrome per se, including, including fatty liver. This is an adult. This is a child that I met when I was in Australia. This is an Aboriginal child. You can see the accumulation of uh, visceral fat is very evident. These two are the two Italian children coming from Chieti, and you can see more or less is the same. So the accumulation of visceral fat is a very important, I think, issue that we can appreciate. Uh, we in Italy made uh, some years ago now, several years ago already, um, a, a quite a wide, uh, study on almost a thousand children uh, with uh, normal weight, overweight and obesity. And we categorized these children in different, uh, in different uh, uh, people. Number one were those with the normal weight with waist circumference less than 19th percentile, normal weight with waist circumference more than 90th percentile, normal weight, overweight with the uh, waist circumference lower than 90 percentile, 
overweight with weight circumference more than 90 percentile and obese children with the weight circumference more than 90 percentile. And again, to cut a long, a long story short, those children overweight with weight circumference more than 90 percentile and the null ratio of developing metabolic syndrome later in life of four times almost. And if they are obese, frankly obese, and they have weight circumference more than 90 percentile, then the, the odds, odd ratio, please appreciate, is uh, six times, even more than six times higher. The children overweight with weight circumference less than 90 percentile. So even more interesting, for the practical pediatricians is the fact that if you measure weight circumference related to height, then again, those with the, uh, with the waist to height ratio more than 0.5 have eight of a uh, odd ratio and the, of those with obesity and the waist circumference to height ratio more than 0.5 have 12 of odds ratios, which is, which is uh, four times those, the risk for, over, for children with overweight and waist to height ratio less than 0.5. What it doesn't mean, I'm going to finish my presentation, is if you have a child, uh, say 100, uh, 130 centimeters height, and the waist circumference is 70, that, that the ratio is 0.5. So you can categorize this child as an increased risk for developing the uh, metabolic syndrome. That is it. So, ladies and gentlemen, uh, it's late. I was uh, thinking to short, shorten up. I think that, I, think that uh, I hope that I convinced you that obesity is one of the major public health problems. Uh, and the prevalence of obesity has been increasing dramatically, say. It's, it's really, a, it's really a Damocles sword on the future generations. Obesity is associated with the development of several endocrine comorbidities, <clears throat> particularly type two diabetes, you can imagine we will have millions and millions of uh, uh, adults in the future with type 2 diabetes. We pediatricians have a duty to understand that metabolic syndrome must be defined early in the course of childhood. We should not, please, wait until puberty, uh, as the IDF definition forced us, us to do. Obesity with the features of metabolic syndrome should be considered during routine clinical practice rather than metabolic syndrome as a separate entity. Well, that, this is very important. For instance, I don't know in Chile, but in Italy, the primary care is provided by primary care pediatricians. And this is very important because the, the, those pediatricians are those close to the, the child and to the family and they can actually be able to uh, detect children early in the course of, uh, of uh, uh, obesity in the child. There is no specific treatment for, I don't have the time to go into details, maybe we can come back. I have several slides on this, we'll come back to this during the, the discussion. There is no specific treatment and we have to discuss about uh, um, evidence when we speak about medicine. There is no specific treatment for the metabolic syndrome in children, but there is guidance related to its individual components, such as particularly insulin resistance or hypertension. You, you may argue, you may argue that uh, uh, the role of metformin, for instance, when to use metformin in children, when to use uh, and which drug we should use for the management of hypertension. Uh, which drug we should use for hyperlipidemia, when we should use statins, for instance, which kind of statins we should use. These are all things that are uh, possibly for discussion, maybe that uh, 
we can have another seminar on that. But what I think is important for this afternoon is to be all pediatricians around the world should be uh, persuaded that obesity is a disease, number one, is associated with many comorbidities. We must be aware of that, possibly detect them properly and timely and treat them properly and timely. I think this is our duty and I hope that during the discussion we can reach an agreement possibly on how to detect and how to manage uh, metabolic syndrome in children. Muchas gracias. Thank you. Muchas gracias, Franco, por la excelente presentación. Y can you cut your presentation for see the... Eh, Sam, ¿alguna pregunta en el auditorio que no alcanzo a ver todo? Sí, doctor, hay una pregunta que se hizo en el auditorio que está relacionada con eh, el uso de metformina en, solamente con obesidad e insulino resistencia. So the question is if uh, the obesity and just uh, children with insulin resistance uh, may be treated with metformin without uh, intolerance, glucose intolerance. So this is a very important question. If I had the, had the time, I could have spoke, spoke, spoken about uh, management. Uh, I have many slides on this. Uh, let me go quickly. This is a child that we saw in our clinic. Um, let me, first, we should uh, try to say like this. Uh, obesity without insulin resistance I think we should manage with the diet and exercise. Although I can tell you, if you look at uh, robust data on this very issue, we don't have many robust data on that. Obviously, it's obvious we have to reduce uh, caloric intake to increase uh, uh, exercise, but still very structured studies are not very strong terms of uh, evidence. <laughs> and if we have insulin resistance, and then we can discuss what is insulin resistance. If you look at this child that uh, I was showing you, this child, Sophia, she had uh, acanthosis nigricans, you can appreciate here. This lady was followed up by, in our clinic for a while, with you see here, uh, acanthosis nigricans, stretch marks, hirsutism, uh, which is a typical child, uh, almost a quintal, see here, yeah, the weight. So what to do with this lady? And also arterial hypertension, stage two hypertension. So to answer your question, let's, let me go to the, uh, sorry about that, but let me go quickly to metformin. Metformin is a good drug, let's say like this. And uh, if you have uh, a child with uh, very high OMA IR or very low Matsuda index, then I think we pediatricians should try to make an attempt to use the metformin. If the child is uh, really a uh, detected uh, insulin resistance. Because there are some people here uh, it's not easy to you to measure insulin resistance in children. As you may know, I was responsible for the uh, SP uh, consensus meeting on insulin resistance in children. It's not easy. It, it, ideally, we should perform a clamp. Like a clamp is not possible to do everywhere in the world. So we have to have a simple measure. And obviously, for, uh, for a simple measure, we can use OMIR, which means that we can use the uh, relation, the, the ratio between glucose and insulin uh, <clears throat> in everyday life. So in this, this slide shows you, reminds you about the, uh, the role of metformin. Metformin is a fantastic drug. It's an old drug, but it's a very nice drug. 
particularly appreciate not only the reduction of gluconeogenesis, the increase of glucose utilization, but also the role in, in reducing inflammation, which is not trivial in a child, in a patient with metabolic syndrome. So to answer your question, the USFDA and also uh, the European Medicine Agency, I don't know in Chile if it is approved, but in Italy is approved for 10 years, for more than 10 years old, in, ch in children with type 2 diabetes. And the Italian uh, um, uh, medicine agency um, shows all that we, should, we could use also in uh, children older than eight years. We don't have data in, uh, in the smaller children. So metformin is the only treatment in children with uh, pre-diabetes. A long-term studies to evaluate its role in children and adolescents are not available today. You may know the story of, uh, of uh, uh, the two-day trial. Anyway, so far, uh, the uh, statement of the uh, Endocrine Society, the Pediatric Obesity Clinical Guidelines from the Endocrine Society is that the use of metformin for the management of insulin resistance and obesity is not evidence-based in children. And in fact, if you look at the data, I don't know if I have the, the slides here, but the data here uh, with the today's study was very clear that metformin was not enough effective to reduce uh, the, uh, the, the risk of developing type 2 diabetes in, pre, in children with pre-diabetes. Uh, mm -hmm. The association between metformin and rosiglitazone was much better. So let's say like this, I don't know if you agree, you can challenge me, of course. Uh, in some selected cases, we can use metformin. My suggestion is to, you, to start with uh, quite a low dose which is 500 milligrams twice a day, because sometimes they have uh, abdominal pain and it is unbearable for them. And then in some adolescents, there is a paper on that, although I didn't have the time to show you. In some patients, you have to go up to two grams or even three grams per day to get an effective uh, action of metformin on the glucose intolerance in children. So be very cautious because uh, it is important to use the low dose. But at the end of the day, if you really want to have a reduction in insulin levels, you have to use uh, much higher doses with, compared to those that we normally use. I don't know if uh, Alejandro or mm -hmm. Hernan want to, to comment on that. Franco, I want to ask another question. What do you think about this mathematical method that established the score for metabolic syndrome in children? There is a new one published in plus one the last two years. What do you think about the clinical application of this score? You know, the score, uh, I showed one of the scores, which is yes. the eye defense, which, which we normally use, uh, at least I use, uh, if I want to uh, evaluate risk. Obviously, we, people who are uh, experts in the field, there are some children, this is our big limit, uh, Hernan, that we actually do, we do not know the children who really need to be treated there in the course. And why I'm saying that, if you look at a child, say 10 years old, with uh, very high OMA IR and say very high insulin levels, then we, 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 we can say, okay, this is and the visceral fat, all the, the risk factors for metabolic syndrome. Then you, we, everybody can say, okay, let's start, uh, try to, to reduce the weight, try to increase ex, uh, physical exercise, also, although it's difficult to standardize, and then say, okay, let, let's start with the metformin. And then this child should get a metformin for 50 years, more or less. So I'm not sure that this is the way to, 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 to go ahead. I think 
at the end of the day, uh, we should try to invest more in prevention. I, I'm, I understand that it's easy to say, difficult to do. I understand that. But uh, if we really want to reduce the risk for these generations to develop, uh, to have massive children with the type 2 diabetes and cardiovascular risk, we have to invest in the prevention. I'll tell you, I was, I, I was to China many times. You know, the, the, the rural China doesn't exist anymore. And uh, if you go to Shanghai, it's uh, similar to go to New York many years ago. So what about this massive percentage of Chinese children with obesity in the future, in one generation? Okay, so we, the, we, we, the risk is uh, none that we will have uh, hundred millions of people, adult people with uh, that type two diabetes and cardiovascular diseases. And this is something that we have to think about. Let me give you shortly then a, some optimism, because so, so far I've been pessimist, pessimistic. Mm -hmm. um, let's go on the GLP-1 analogs, right? We want to discuss with you on GLP-1 analogs for a while. I'll tell you, uh, these are the statins. I don't know if we want to discuss about the statins. But if you look at liraglutide, okay, GLP-1 analogs are fantastic drugs. And that they are in the pipeline for pediatrics. You may be aware of some data on the, uh, on the pharmacokinetics of uh, liraglutide, for instance, and other GM exenatide as well. And there, is, there are data showing that uh, liraglutide in children and adolescents, these, are, these were children, uh, say, prepubertal children, and particularly adolescents. And you see, may appreciate that the, the glycated hemoglobin and the fasting plasma glucose were ma very much reduced after six months and after one year of liraglutide. These are adolescents with type 2 diabetes. And then, and then there was a paper on uh, obese adolescents showing that the, the, the signs of metabolic syndrome were much better with the liraglutide compared with placebo. Okay, so we know now that even in adolescence, we could use GLP-1 analogs. But a very recent paper published last week, okay, last week, which was a, a meta-analysis of uh, the role of uh, GLP-1 analogs in, uh, in obese children, not in, uh, in uh, uh, type 2 diabetic children in obese children, showing that the, the GLP-1 analogs, very good drugs, fantastic drugs, are able to reduce the weight, reduce the BMI, so and so, not very much. Uh, we're able to reduce HbA1c, these are obese children, eh? and fasting plasma glucose. They had some side effects, side effects on vomiting, diarrhea, particularly abdominal pain, you see. But at the end of the day, if you appreciate the, the role of uh, uh, GLP-1 analogs on the major risk factors for metabolic syndrome, at the end of the day, the advantage is not that much. So at the end of the day, if you read this paper, it's very interesting, very appropriate even in terms of selection of the, the papers, the evidence that if we use liraglutide or xenatide in adolescents early in the course of metabolic syndrome, we can have a long-term advantage is not that strong. Thank you very uh, much. Yeah. There are two, um, the two last questions are, uh, one is from Jose Espolidoro and he would like to hear 
from you about the importance of microbiota in the obesity and if do you think there are any role for pre or probiotics in the obesity treatment? And the last question is from Salvatore Grosso. Uh, he asks you if you are so kind to say some words about the fructosa in popular beverage, insulin hepatic resistance and lipogenesis. Thank you very much. Fructose, fructose you said? Sorry. Yes, fruct fructose yes. in popular yes. beverage. Okay. And insulin okay. resistance. Two very, two very interesting questions. Uh, we have uh, several seminars on uh, microbiota. We discuss with our young, young fellows about this one. To be honest, um, we have some experience on that because uh, um, one of my fellows, uh, Valentina Chiavaroli, has spent uh, uh, three years, uh, almost four years in, in Auckland, New Zealand, to study the role of metabolic syndrome, uh, sorry, of microbiota in the developing of obesity and metabolic syndrome and even type, uh, autoimmune disorders. To be extremely honest, uh, I don't see evidence enough to say that uh, we could use prebiotics uh, or even worse, probiotics uh, for prevention of obesity. Uh, to me, I don't know if you want to challenge me, I'm ready, but uh, I don't think we have uh, enough evidence so far to say that if we give prebiotics uh, for uh, five years you know, to a newborn, we can prevent obesity. I think we have to act in, uh, on other issues, which is mainly education of people. Uh, difficult, I, I understand that, but we can't rely on prebiotics to prevent obesity. This is my honest and humble answer. We, have, we don't have evidence. The fructose is very interesting. Uh, let me show you a paper, uh, the final one. We didn't have time, uh, Alejandro, to speak about statins. Maybe next time. Um, let me show you to answer Professor Grosso questions. Oh, here we are. This paper was published on Journal of Clinical Endocrinology and Metabolism. You can see here, if a child uh, drinks fructose, fructose is very dangerous for uh, the liver particularly. And if you look at the, uh, the, um, the time after the ingestion of fructose in lean, in blue, and obese children here, you can appreciate that the, the particularly the insulin, the glucose is fine, both in lean and obese, but in obese children, the insulin, the, 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 the quantity of, ins of insulin uh, needed for uh, counteract the hyperglycemia related to fructose is much higher. In other words, if you use uh, fructose and fructose addiction, to the, to the drinks, this should cause an increase in insulin more than in, in glucose. So therefore, fructose is a very nasty guy because uh, at, uh, in the long term may favor hyperinsulinemia and hypertriglyceridemia. There are several data on that, that the, uh, the risk for uh, um, fatty liver is much increased if, you, if there is the use of, of fructose. So therefore fructose should not be used in children. This is what I suggest. And the, you may know Robert Lastig. Robert uh, has done several studies in San Francisco in the U, UCSF on this very issue of the, the, the role of uh, fructose in uh, the development of uh, obesity, uh, hyperinsulinemia, and metabolic syndrome, and even hypertension. So therefore, fructose should not be used in children. Okay, 
Bueno, eh, muchas gracias a todos. Uh, I would like to thank Professor Gerelli for this great, uh, we are very grateful for this complete and very interesting talk. And also, I would like to thank to, for everybody, for everyone who connect from Mexico, Ecuador, Colombia, Peru, Brazil, from Spain, um, and for, from Cambridge in UK. So, uh, Professor Chiarelli, thank you very much again. Um, we really hope to see you soon. Thanks. My pleasure, Alejandro. Muchas gracias. Thank you no, thank chao, you very much. chao, Franco. Muchas gracias por todo. Chao. Chao. Take care. Greetings to the family. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Thanks.